to this keynote debate, Trust 10 Years After the Financial Crisis, Have We Learned the Lessons? My name is Rob Lyons. I'm Science and Technology Director at the Academy of Ideas, and perhaps more pertinently, I'm convener of the Academy's Economy Forum. We'd like to thank ACCA, the Association of Certified Chartered Accountants, for being our partners on this session, both financially and actually intellectually, as you'll see shortly. Back in two, August 2008, the then Chancellor of the Exchequer, Alistair Darling, gave an interview to The Guardian, uh, in, which caused quite a fuss, in which he said, the economic times faced by Britain and the rest of the world are arguably the worst they've been in 60 years, adding, and I think it's going to be more profound and long-lasting than people thought. And I probably wasn't alone in thinking, come on, Alistair, you know, you're over-egging it here. Um, but within weeks, Lehman Brothers had collapsed and um, the, the financial crisis as we know it had really kicked off. Um, and, you know, so when the crisis came, it came dramatically, even if there had been warning signs you know, since the collapse of Northern Rock the year before. But 10 years on, have we learned the lessons? What did cause the crisis? Is it enough to say that it's just some greedy bankers? They've been sacked, the system's been reformed, it won't happen again. And in worrying about the financial crisis, could we miss a different crisis that's on its way? Are we in danger of fighting the last battle all over again? Um, and why have we struggled to recover from this crisis? We're still very much living with the legacy of 2008. Those are just some of the questions that we could cover in this session. I'm, glad, I'm sure the speakers will pick up on others. And I'm really glad we've got a great panel of speakers uh, to discuss this topic. I think it's a really, really important one. First to speak on my far left is Linda Yu. She's a fellow in economics at St. Edmund Hall, Oxford University, and adjunct professor of economics at the London Business School. She's also a visiting senior fellow at London School of Economics and Political Sciences, foreign policy think tank Ideas. Linda is a TV and radio presenter, including for Radio 4 and the World Service, as well as having fronted BBC TV series such as The New Middle Class, Next Billionaires and Working Lives. Um, her new book, just, uh, which came out this year, is called The Great Economists, How Their Ideas Can Help Us Today, which is a really, really nice read that balances presenting important economic ideas with some nice bi biographical details of the, the various figures that she's looking at. And she'll be signing copies of it afterwards as well, if you'd like to um, get a copy and have Linda personalise it for you. Next to speak on my left is Philip Legrain. He, he is a critically acclaimed thinker and communicator who also has high-level policy experience. A senior visiting fellow at the London School of Economics' European Institute. He is the founder of the Open Political Economy Network. He is also a columnist for Project Syndicate and Foreign Policy, a commentator for many other international publications and media outlets, and a public speaker around the world. Philippe is the author of four best-selling books, notably Immigrants, Your Country Needs Them, which was shortlisted for the Financial Times Business Book of the Year. And... Uh, the book that I inspired me to ask him if he would join us today was Aftershock, Reshaping the World Economy After the Crisis. So welcome to Philippe. Uh, on my right is Maggie McGee. She is the newly appointed Executive Director of Governance at ACCA, the Association of Certified Chartered Accountants. In this role, she has responsibility for both ACCA's corporate government arrangements and the governance of ACCA members and students. A chartered accountant with a degree in law, Maggie trained with the National Audit Office UK, where she was a Director General of Audit. Before joining ACCA, Maggie worked for PwC in the Advanced Regulatory and Compliance Analytics area, applying specialist analytics tools to clients in the banking and capital markets sector. And since the regulation of banking is very much central to what we're going to be, going to be talking about, it's great to have Maggie on the panel. And finally, uh, Daniel ben -Ami on the uh, far right has worked as a writer for many years, during which he has contributed to numerous national national, specialist and international publications. Ferraris for All, his book Defending Economic Progress, was published in 2010. His book on global finance, Cowardly Capitalism, was published in 2001 and was recommended by the Baker Library of Harvard Business School. So that's our panel. Can we welcome them, please? So um, I've asked the speakers to speak for five to seven minutes each, uh, outlining their initial thoughts on the topic, and then we'll take the debate out to you. So, Linda, if you could kick us off. Thank you very much to Rob um, and to the Academy of Ideas for inviting me to uh, speak on this topic, which I think is going to generate, I hope, a good discussion um, this morning. It's a very important topic to think about trust 10 years after 
the financial crisis. So to start off, before I um, give you my sort of thoughts, I'm just curious, how many of you, with a show of hands, trust the financial system more now than you did before the crash? All right, so there's about half a dozen of you optimists out there. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you trust the financial system less? Okay. Okay. I think this is a good um, basis for what I'm about to, to say next, which is I think the reason I was invited to join this panel is that in my new book, The Great Economists, I have a chapter titled, Can We Learn from Financial Crises? It's a question mark. And one of the things that I look at is what happened to the breakdown in trust in consensus around the economic and financial system that happened after the last systemic banking crisis, which was, of course, the great crash of 1929 and then the 1930s uh, Great Depression. So, as you know, our 2008 banking crisis was really the first systemic banking crisis that's happened in advanced economies since the 1930s. So this period, the past decade, um, the recession that followed the banking crisis is known as the Great Recession. And as you know, recessions are slightly better than depressions. So it seems, and I'll go through this, that we may have learned some of the lessons. Um, uh, just as a matter of, matter of definition, a recession is two consecutive quarters of economic contraction. Or as Ronald Reagan, the former US president, put it, a recession is when your neighbor loses his job. A depression is when you lose your job. The reason I was looking back over history is because some of the economic but also social consequences that followed from the last systemic banking crisis, I think, holds lessons for how we might think about reconstituting trust in the system and building a new consensus. So I start off the chapter talking about the Occupy movement, which arose right after the 2008 banking crisis, and that pointed to a breakdown in consensus around how it is that our financial, banking, economic, social system should really be constituted. And this will be unsurprising to you um, that is not the first time we've had a breakdown in consensus. So I mentioned the 1930s as the most direct parallel but actually, this goes further back. So let me just give you what I think some of the lessons are around rebuilding trust and consensus, looking over history. Oh, and by the way, the reason I was looking over history is also because of the saying by Mark Twain, um, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. So the episodes that I've looked at hold similarities, but obviously vast differences. So the first real breakdown in consensus that we had was in the 19th century, during the Great Depression of the 19th century, known as the Long Depression. The Panic of 1873, which was bank failures in America leading to contagion and generating a depression that spread around advanced economies, that was when unemployment appeared for the first time in the dictionary. And that led to a breakdown in belief in the system. The capitalist system that had been in place since the 18th century, the Adam Smith, the classical economist form, was um, debated, Marxism came into prominence then, and it wasn't until the middle part of the 20th century, so encompassing the 1930s, where the consensus broke down even further, that we ended up after World War II with what became known as welfare state capitalism. So it was a capitalist system, but with a welfare state in this country, the NHS, in America, social security. So that recast the relationship between society, societal actors, government, and the financial system. And 
the person that I wrote about, several people played a part in this among the great economists who are looking at the issues and saying, you can't just learn lessons in terms of how you regulate the financial system or how monetary policy should operate. You have to look at the bigger picture. So one of the things that I learned from writing this book is the great economists were not just narrowly focused on economics. They were philosophers. They um, tackled history. They tackled sociology. They brought in uh, political science, psychology. All of this matters in shaping the consensus around the society that we wish to live in. So this consensus from the 1950s and 60s led to a golden age of economic growth. And this consensus started to break down again um, after the end of the 1980s. So you remember then the fall of communism. I used, there are gonna be people here who don't remember the fall of the Berlin Wall, so I'm just gonna say it was a big event for those of us who remember it. <laughs> and that seemed to herald a period where um, the, cap, the communist system lost out to the capitalist system and globalization um, brought a lot of emerging markets as they reintegrated back into the global fold. And we seem to have a consensus around how the system should work. But after 2008, clearly that consensus has broken down again. I said at the beginning, there were lessons that were learned. So for instance, monetary policy was much more accommodative because in the 1930s, the great economist um, Milton Friedman pointed out that was the cause of the Great Depression, a contraction in the money supply. So there were policy lessons learned, but I only have less than a minute now. Um, what I wanted to point out was we are still in the midst of understanding the breakdown and consensus around our social and economic system. And it may be a while yet before this consensus becomes reformed, but I think this debate, this kind of debate, is exactly what we need in order to properly learn the lessons of various financial crises and break down in trust in the economic system so we can fashion a system that is much, much better suited to our 21st century society. Okay. I look forward to having this conversation. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning. In the aftermath of the financial crisis that preceded um, the Great Depression, the financial system, the economy, uh, and politics were fundamentally changed for decades. Finance uh, was caged so that the periodic financial crises that Linda referred to that had happened over the past century uh, became a thing of the past. State intervention in the economy proliferated uh, with Roosevelt's New Deal uh, to kickstart growth, uh, with increased uh, planning and regulation to micromanage uh, the economy, and with, of course, the huge expansion of the welfare state. And politics was shaken up too. The far right was in the ascendant in the 1930s, not just in Hitler's Germany, but across most of Europe, including here in the UK, though that's been kind of largely erased uh, from history. And then following the defeat uh, of uh, fascism in the Second World War, uh, the center of political gravity uh, swung to the left. Now, of course, you can't attribute all of those changes wholly to the preceding uh, financial crisis. Even so, the contrast with today is stark. Whereas the Great Depression transformed the political economy of Britain and indeed of the West, the recent financial crisis and the ensuing uh, Great Recession have had so, f so far had a much more limited impact on the financial system and on the economy. And that's one big reason why it's now provoking a political backlash, though one that still pales in comparison with the 1930s. So basically the short answer to the question of this session, have we learnt the lessons of the financial crisis? The short answer 
is no. Now, for sure, some of you think uh, that, the that they trust the financial system more. Um, banks have got a little bit safer for now. They're less excessively profitable than they were. But the focus of post-crisis efforts has basically uh, has been on getting the existing financial system afloat, on, trim on trimming its sails a bit, but not on fundamental reform. Or if you look at the economy as a whole, there are a few bells and whistles that have been added. You know, you have an industrial strategy here, a living wage there. But basically, the UK's economic model is unchanged. Again, the focus of post-crisis efforts has been on getting the existing economy uh, going again and on strengthening uh, public finances, not on deep-seated reform. We've had a decade of near-zero interest rates and lots of QE. At the same time, we've had gradual reductions uh, in public borrowing and spending uh, through austerity, which is a bit like having one foot on the accelerator uh, and one foot on the brake. And at, what do we see a decade later? We find an economy that is still unhealthily reliant on debt, on property speculation, uh, and on financial gambling. An economy that remains poor at exporting, despite the huge devaluations of 2008 and 2016. And a truly dismal performance of both productivity and wages, worse even uh, than before uh, the crisis. And you see, the really, really big changes that have happened in the economy are largely due to the all-pervasive impact of new digital technologies, not due to post-crisis changes in government policy. So while it's a simplification, it's not inaccurate to say that we've had bank bailouts and QE for the wealthy and wage cuts and austerity for everyone else. No wonder people are angry. And on top of that, the crisis and its aftermath have shredded trust in the people who run the economy and the country, who claimed that they deserved outsized rewards for the wealth that they were generating for society, for the competence with which they were managing the economy, and yet who led us blindly into the crash and have been unwilling or unable to put things right since. Those people and institutions, you can call them the establishment or the elites, are now widely seen as incompetent, out of touch, self-serving, and corrupt. And in part through their actions, but also by association, everything that they are seen to believe in, whether it is globalization or openness uh, to immigration, is also tarnished or discredited. And unscrupulous politicians have been quick to seize on people's fear and anger, which ought to be directed at bankers and politicians and to direct it at foreigners, be it the Chinese or immigrants. So the bottom line, a decade after the crisis, is that our financial system and our economy remain dysfunctional and trust in politics and our institutions is bust. Okay, thank you very much. Great points there. Um, Maggie. Thank you and, and good afternoon and it's a, a pleasure to be here uh, at the Institute of Ideas. Uh, and I thought actually the first element uh, where Linda did the, the poll um, asking about trust was uh, very interesting and insightful in terms of those whose trust has grown uh, since the financial crisis. Um, so what I was going to touch on today is very much um, did we do the right thing at the point of the financial crisis? So in the aftermath of the financial crisis, it would be very difficult to argue that there wasn't a reaction. But I think what we really need to challenge now is, is was it the right reaction? 
And if you look at the regulatory developments that have impacted uh, on the banking system, and they, they have been pervasive. We've got Dodd-Frank, which Obama introduced back in 2010, which increased regulation, uh, streamlined the regulatory bodies. Um, it's certainly been viewed as having sort of helped in terms of transparency and also in terms of consumer protection. But we're already seeing issues in terms of its economic impact. And of course, we're already seeing a rollback from that uh, under the Trump administration. We've had Basel III, uh, and in the Europe itself, we've had MIFID, the, the Markets and Financial Instruments Directive. Uh, and that sought to regulate or, or bring uh, consistency to the regulatory environment across the EU states. And of course, here in the UK, we've had our own specific regulation, which has brought in uh, a regulatory structure for the UK for a UK financial services post-crisis. That's very easy to do, very easy to look at the impact of the crisis and look at what you can do in terms of regulatory changes and developments. But whilst inadequate regulation definitely played a part in the crisis, it was not the sole cause. What we've seen was that some rules were, were definitely missing, uh, but actually what we also seen is that other rules were, were broken or abused. Uh, and the fact is the financial services employs a great deal of very, very intelligent individuals. They're remunerated exceptionally highly, uh, and they're attracted to that for the remuneration, but also for the intellectual capacity that it brings, especially if we look at trading. So tighter regulation in that environment, it will treat some of the symptoms, but we cannot look at that as a cure. And I think if we think about what treatment do we need today, and I think it's a discussion that really hasn't been loud enough over the past decade or so, is actually about culture and about ethics. That's both within financial services, but it's also more broadly within society and across all business. So this Wednesday is actually Global Ethics Day. Uh, so it's a day, it's led by the Carnegie Council for Ethics in International Affairs. And it's, it's designed as a day for everyone. So it's from business, but also to society at large. And it's a day when we should come together to talk about both our individual, but also our collective responsibility to act ethically in what is a really increasingly complex and fast-paced world. So the events, if we look back to 2008, they, they shocked the world. Um, from leaders to employees to experts who became the brunt uh, of a lot of the criticism to media pundits who, who made their name at that point. And whilst with a few and a very small number uh, of exceptions, we actually didn't predict the extent of the problems. And we didn't predict uh, the capacity for long-term economic damage. And we're seeing that come out uh, both in the UK, but globally in terms of the increasing gap between the rich and poor, an area where actually opportunity isn't seen uh, and actually probably isn't open to all, be that opportunity for income, be that opportunity for wealth, uh, or be that opportunity for access. I think if we look now, the world has really changed uh, beyond anything we could have dreamed back, back when we started building the financial structures. And the world has really been quite frantic in our attempts to really sort of patch up the holes that are appearing in our rules and regulations. So I would, I would pick up very much on Philippe's point that we haven't looked at systematic change to the system. We've looked at patching and mending the system that was already in place. And whether that will serve as well into the long-term future, I think is very, very much debatable. So over the past 10 years, it's been focused very much on repairing, refocused on rebuilding, not necessarily for the advantage of all. And here in the UK, if we look at what we've done, we've, we've levied the banks to attempt to restore the taxpayers' coffers in terms of the, of the bailouts that, that the government undertook. We've also restructured the regulatory bodies that keep actually the financial systems in check or their role is to keep it in check. 
But actually, none of that will have any impact whatsoever if we cannot rebuild ethics more broadly, trust, professionalism. And all of that has to sit at the very core of any system to succeed. And we also have to look at the fast pace of change. Rules and regulations will change as the global economy does. But actually, what we have to recognise is we'll never be able to adapt fast enough to meet the new challenges that will face us a decade into the future. We're already dealing with a much more complex financial environment than we were back in 2018. And those changes have been brought about by technology largely. So we've got the rise of fintech, we've got cryptocurrencies, we've got distributed ledgers and, and really everything in between. And actually, I've no doubt that there will be entirely different a decade on from now. But an ethical compass actually tells you to do the right thing no matter what the circumstances. So you have to think about the broader impact of what you're doing on yourself, on your business, and the actions on society around yourself. And that should be regardless of the profit incentive. Financial professionals are actually, they're the trusted with their life savings. Uh, they're trusted by businesses, with economies, and with prosperity. And actually, before the global crisis, that trust was handed over, really, without much thought. So stronger regulation was definitely needed. Uh, but we also need to have a greater degree of individual and collective responsibility from the finance professionals themselves who've been entrusted with so much. So I think if we look at it 10 years on from the financial crisis and three days before Global Ethics Day, we really need to collectively stand up to take responsibility for the trust that's been lost and, and to show through our actions and not just our words that we're actually ready to rebuild it. So I don't think in conclusion that we've really learnt the lessons of the financial crisis and actually I think we probably shouldn't ever. Uh, but we should remember the catastrophic impact of failure of ethics and of professionalism and that is an important reminder to make sure that we can prevent it from happening to the same scale again. Thank okay, you. thanks very much. <laughs> Daniel. Uh, well, I find myself agreeing with uh, <clears throat> some of the panellists, which is unusual for me. I usually end up having a, a row <laughs> with uh, other panellists. But uh, I think it's the, it, it certainly is the case that we haven't learned the lessons of the financial crisis. And by we, I'm not talking about we, the panellists, but I think the discussion in the West generally completely clear to me anyway it has you know the lessons have not been learned I, I think although I agree with quite a few of the things that Phil said and Maggie said I think my take on it is a bit different because for me a key problem to cut through in terms of understanding what is going on is what I would call financial fetishism which is difficult to say so I'll try not to say it too often in my introduction but what I mean by that is that the whole focus of the problems that we're facing in the West, and there are many problems, so economic problems, the whole discussion of populism and anti-populism, is very much focused on finance. Finance has given this power to people say, it's finance. It's the pernicious uh, force of the financial institutions. It's the fact that financial institutions weren't properly regulated. Fundamentally, it's finance that's the problem, and we have to understand things through the prism of finance. That's the kind of mainstream view. And I think that's entirely wrong. I mean, clearly finance does play an important role, but I think it's much more subsidiary to other factors than is generally understood. So one way of looking at this is uh, chronological. People forget now that there were lots of long-standing economic problems before the financial crisis of 2008. So, for example, productivity, uh, which is the amount that is produced in a given time in a, by a, an employee in, a, in an hour or in a day, that has been on a declining uh, trend, a declining rate of growth, and now kind of stagnant for a very long time, arguably since the 70s or the 80s. And productivity, as I'm sure, well, Linda can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think most of her, if not all of her great economists would agree, 
Productivity is absolutely key to the health of the economy. If you really want to see how strong and vibrant an economy is, you need to look at how productive it is and how fast productivity growth is. And yet that has been on a downward trend since the 70s and the 80s. If you want to look at low levels of investment, business investment, again, that's really been on a declining trend at least since the 1980s. You know, there's been cyclical ups and downs, but there's been a problematic trend for a long time before 2008, before the financial crisis. And if anything, I would argue that the financial crisis of 2008, 7, 8, 9, however you want to define it, was more a result of those long-term economic problems rather than the cause. I mean, it is true that a recession followed the financial crisis, but it's wrong to see it as the cause. Because what you've had, I would argue, is a political class that is just to use that awful phrase. It's just kind of kicked the can down the road. In other words, rather than trying to deal with these long-standing problems of low investment, of low productivity, what they've basically done is they've just kept public spending high, they've kept interest rates low, so business can keep on ticking over. And that, it was that kind of ineffective dealing with the fundamental economic problems which created the basis for the financial bubble to emerge. Because obviously if you have low interest rates, if credit, credit is cheap, uh, if credit is cheap, then that creates the conditions in which a financial bubble can, bur can blow up and then can burst. It's very much, Lehman is very much the middle of the story rather than the end of the story. Obviously, we don't know the end point, but to see it in terms of financial institutions being the problem, uh, blaming it all on financial institutions, not that they're perfect, because clearly they're not, I think that's entirely wrong. And even if you take the stagnation of living standards, which you see not uniformly across everyone in the Western world, but a large number of people uh, in, you can see it in America, you can see it in Germany, probably most clearly that wages for a large section of the population have been stagnant for a very long time, since the 80s, 90s. So it's not, it's not just a question of inequality. Inequality is one thing, and we can discuss that, but it is possible to have inequality at rising living standards. You've had for a large section of the population uh, stagnant living standards, which, as Phil rightly says, that really pisses people off. But this is something that was arguably exacerbated by, by the financial crisis, arguably made matters worse, but it wasn't created by them. It kind of pre predated the financial crisis. It's pre precisely the fact that the economies were lacking in dynamism that meant you've had this long-term squeeze in income, long-term squeeze in living standards. So it's not Lehman, uh, the Lehman crisis, the global financial crisis more broadly, that is the cause of it. Again, it's the result of a much more long-running economic problem. And if you look at policy in response to the financial crisis, what we've had is QE, quantitative easing. In other words, the governments and central banks just creating money. So what they're really doing is they haven't learned the lessons at all. They're just financialising the economy even more because temporarily you can deal with the, uh, the problem of... You can't... You can't solve the problem, but you can keep the economy ticking over by pumping money into it in the short term. But, you know, that's essentially just on a greater scale doing what they were doing before, you know, before 2008. And really what they're doing now, I would argue, is creating the conditions for a new financial crisis. We don't know what form it will take. It, won't, it certainly won't take exactly the same form as the Lehman crisis, but they're just creating another bubble. So I think, and I take no joy in saying this, but I think there have been 10 wasted years. 10 years when we really could have started to get to grips with economic problems, started to tackle the problems of low investment and low productivity, start to uh, create the conditions to increase people's living standards. We haven't really done that at all. We've wasted the time, and we really do need to learn the lessons. E e albeit belatedly, we need to learn the lessons of Lehman and of the long-term economic crisis more generally. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Maggie. You, you talk about ethics and a culture, a professionalism, etc. In the sort of, I mean, if you look at the, yeah, the popular pre presentation, like the Wolf of Wall Street or something, 
There's a lot of money going around, and it's very easy to forget your ethics in those circumstances, especially when people start to say, saying things like, we've got all these subprime mortgages, but don't worry, because we can just wrap them up in these things called collateralized, collateralized debt obligations, or financial mincemeat, as would probably be the better way of describing them, and say that they're really safe. So don't worry about it, just crack on and sell them and trade them. Is ethics enough, or can we, is it possible to create that culture in, in, in the world of money? I think it's very much a challenge to create it in the world of money, and I think it very much depends on the incentives placed there. Uh, and of course, a huge amount has been focused on, if we, if we look at banking in terms of banking bonuses and the remuneration, actually very little has changed regardless of all the activity in that place and all the negative attention being forced towards it. Um, the, the total pool last year in, in London was, was 15 billion in terms of a bonus pool. So we're still seeing the, the drivers for some of the behavior not being tackled effectively. But actually we have to look, take a step back and say an ethical compass is key to resolving the problems longer term. And it's clear that society itself is placing and expecting far more of business in this world. And that's probably one of the advantages of the financial crisis, is the changing expectations of society on business itself. And I think all of that is going to ex be exacerbated uh, with technology. So the advent of, you know, and the introduction of artificial intelligence, the, uh, uh, machine deep learning, the fact that so many decisions uh, are now being automated actually means that there's a greater emphasis needed on ethics by professionals. Okay. Um, Linda, you talked about consensus and like how we need to like re-establish a consensus and discussions like this would be a great start, but what do you think the consensus should be what, in terms of what needs to change or what kind of yeah, yeah. What, you know, what kind of economy do you envisage might be the way forward? Big question, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, if I knew the answer to that, I would have written a different book. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I genuinely think that um, it, is an, it is a time to re-examine the way you want your society to be governed, the structures you want in place, whether it's around inequality, opportunity, um, and social um, issues as well. So I don't think there's going to be one answer to this. And in, and in terms of what I was um, alluding to earlier, I didn't want to depress you with my opening comments, but the breakdown in consensus after the long depression, the Great Depression of the 19th century, that was when the capitalist system um, devised by Adam Smith, David Ricardo, faced real challenge from Karl Marx, who I also write about. And that was the rise of Marxism, communism, and Marx didn't believe in socialism. He thought that was just tinkering at the edges. He really believed that the only new consensus had to be by revolution. And that debate was not settled for at least close to a century. This is why I didn't want to depress you at the beginning <laughs> about how long this could take, because the 1930s really eroded people's trust in the capitalist system. And you saw in the interwar period, and certainly after World War II, well, and also before, around World War I, the, at that point, around 60% of the world was communist or socialist. And it wasn't until you had a battle of ideas, another plug, <laughs> um, between those who were arguing for a vision of capitalism that was much better suited to providing a social safety net to make the system more inclusive, although that's not the term they used at the time. And that battle between those who believed in the market and those who believed in the state waged on until really, I would say, the end of the Cold War, which was the end of the 1980s. And the beginning of the 1990s was when you saw the disintegration of the former Soviet Union and you saw the, uh, the capitalist or market-based system coming to the forefront. So that was only 30 years ago. 
And we are now at another point where the consensus has broken down around that. And we're having this discussion around what the system for the 21st century should be. And I don't think there are any easy answers. And the other thing is I don't think it's the same answer for different countries. I think every society is going to have to come to a consensus about it themselves. And let me just, I did, as you know, Rob, quite a few biographies, part of biographies in this book. So when I mentioned the rise of Marxism and being adopted by the Soviet Union and by China and other countries, Marx never saw that. He actually passed away before um, these countries kind of took up um, his mantra in his lifetime. He was a constant source of embarrassment because even though he was a revolutionary, his wife signed her stationery, signed her letters uh, with the uh, name Baroness von Westphalen because she was a Prussian aristocrat. And his family remained embarrassed by him throughout his entire life. So, you know, sometimes the recognition comes, you know. Posthumously. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, Philip. so you were, I, I think, not unreasonably very, very rude about both politicians and the leaders of business and so on, about the uh, incompetence and the, the fact that they've been discredited. But, but what is the next step then? I mean, are we, we're talking about replacing a sort of class of individuals or I mean, we, how do we fix that system you know, to solve those problems? Briefly, I have written a book uh, called uh, European Spring, Why Our Economies and Politics Are in a Mess and How to Put Them Right, which does set out um, how I, the, the economic and political reforms that I do think um, are necessary. And it's only like £1.99 on Kindle, so I mean, it really is <laughs> ridiculously cheap. So if you're looking for, the first half is about the crisis in Europe and the second half is about building a better economy and politics. So you might find that interesting. Now, what is really striking is how the, not just the ideas, but the people who espoused those ideas and the people who implemented those ideas have scarcely suffered a loss of reputation and certainly haven't lost their jobs uh, since uh, the financial crisis. They're still listened to, they're see, still seen as you know, people in authority whose views are valuable. And many of them are clearly intelligent people, but at the same time, um, they have believed and espoused and implemented ideas which have failed. And they have perhaps slightly admitted that they've made a mistake here and there, and they've slightly changed their views, but basically it hasn't changed much. Like the IMF runs an annual conference called Rethinking Macro, and you get you know, the same old treads like Larry Summers coming up and basically coming up with very similar to ideas to the ones they held before the crisis, and this is Rethinking Macro because we've slightly shifted a little bit. And you see, well, of course, their professional reputations are all tied up in old ideas which are bankrupt, and they have no incentive um, to change. But what's really um, striking is that those new ideas which emerged really strongly in the 1930s and the 1940s um, and blew away many of the old ideas, that really hasn't happened to any way the same extent uh, as it did previously. And instead of that, the void has been filled by charlatans who point to many genuine problems and merely exacerbate anger and fear about them instead of providing genuine um, solutions. And uh, we see that around Europe, um, from Nigel Farage to Matteo Salvini to uh, Viktor Orban or Donald Trump. And some of the issues they point to are, are, are genuine and real, but the solutions that they provide are not. And therefore, the challenge for those people who have a progressive view is to come forward with new ideas and to win that battle of ideas. I can do that too. Um, <laughs> in order to actually change things for the better so that we don't fall um, into the hands uh, of the charlatans with obnoxious views and no solutions. Okay, thank you. Uh, the Battle of Ideas Book Festival continues all day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Dan Daniel, I think you gave a very um, a compelling sort of d description of the longer term pro problems, but so uh, that sounds pretty intractable. And I, I noticed a Tyler Cowan here is, is, is uh, the, the book jacket um, sort of quote for Linda's book. And Tyler Cowan would say, well, the trouble with productivity is we've picked all the low-hanging fruit. There's, there's no way, easy way of dealing with that. We're not going to get the great productivity increases that we've had in the past. And we just have to live with the new normal. So is that, is that true? Or is, is, there, is, is there something we can do about this to kind of kickstart the economy? 
I don't think it's true, I, although I think what Tyler Cowen represents is a kind of uh, pessimism. There is a huge amount of pessimism about, about the possibility of uh, increasing productivity, making people better off. Uh, I mean, as it happens, if we could get the world to current productivity levels in the West, we'd have a huge global increase in output. But no, I think if you look at the Western economies, there's a huge amount of cash sloshing around. The problem is that it's not really being invested. And I think a, a precondition for getting it invested productively is to stop just pumping for the for governments, the central banks, to not just pump money into the economy and keep credit cheap, but for to stop doing that and then for governments to encourage a process where the weaker businesses do go out of business, uh, the ones which are producing kind of old-fashioned technology, which are not particularly productive, they, they should go out of business. That is the way that capitalism works. But at the same time, and it's very important to see the other side of it, have a set of policies which encourages new investment, new technology, which deals with the social dislocation, because clearly if, you, if businesses go out of business, people do lose their jobs, and that is a, that is a problem. So it also has policies to deal with that. So I think the potential is there, but it means we've got to stop kicking the can down the road. I've got to stop using that phrase because it's terrible. Uh, we've got to stop just pumping money into the economy, but try to work <coughs> out how to, you, to invest that money productively so we can go and uh, increase productivity. There's all sorts of exciting new technologies that can be developed, but not nearly enough resources is being put into them. Okay, right. So, panel relax. I just wanted to get you to clarify your views. Lots of hands, good. If you want uh, explanations of things, by the way, if you think ba Basel III was a, a very poor um, sequel, then uh, please... It was. Just let... <laughs> well, anyway. All right, but that's not another debate. Come on. Okay. I think the issue on ethics uh, is the area that interests me. I mean, we can, you know, uh, get a bit confused about the, the, the whole uh, sort of big picture. Um, to me, the, the, the modus operandi of, of the system in the last 40 years has been the issuance of debt. And um, in 2008, the catalyst was the, the subprime. Um, basically, what's... Uh, uh, you know, from just observation, you can see that that principle of issuing debt, of, of taking short-term benefits from the issuing of the debt, um, you know, has been now applied at a far bigger scale uh, so that the state is now um, uh, doing a lot of the work that the financial industry did before. I can think of three. I'll give you three examples. Very, very quickly. Student loans, help to buy, and equity release. You're talking 150 billion uh, put into the economy. The whole principle behind it is exactly the same as subprime. It will fall over at some point, but we've extended that time period. So I think there's been a corruption of the state since 2008. Uh, and that's, okay. a, that's an ethical issue. Okay. Yeah, um, thank, thanks a lot to everyone. I'm a shareholder in... RBS, first dividend paid on Friday for 10 years. I have an elderly relative who's a rather larger shareholder, and those dividends foregone over all those years were very much the difference between her having to worry about the winter fuel bills and not having to worry. My question is also on the ethical issue, so, but it's for the entire panel, but particularly on Dr. McGee's points. How deep do you think the understanding within banking and finance, auditors and so on, the big accountancy firms, understanding of that, of the need for that has gone, particularly perhaps among younger staff who don't fully remember the crisis, and particularly also on those who are particularly enamored of new technology, or if I might put it this way, those of slightly nerdish tendencies. I once asked a young lady from RBS, had she ever heard of a man called Fred Goodwin? And she replied, no. Mm -hmm. Pass it to the lady behind you, and that's the gentleman here. Yeah, I, um, not to add to everyone's ever-growing book list, but I'm mm -hmm. working my way through Adam Tooze's history of the financial crisis. And actually what strikes you quite a lot is actually, um, in terms of a lot of the regulation and a lot of the build-up to the crisis, how 
obsessed everyone actually is with managing risk. It's all about sort of managing risk. And what happens there is obviously that therefore to manage risk and through regulation, it keeps getting pushed slightly further up to someone else's responsibility of how you manage this, this risk. With the end result being, of course, that the more and more people were concerned about risk and ethics, actually the less unethical and risky their behaviour becomes because it gets filtered up. And then in the aftermath of the crisis, it's the same process. Actually, to minimise the kind of pain, to minimise the kind of risk, it becomes a kind of growing uh, way of going up the sort of cycle until obviously it becomes ultimately the problem of the people of Greece that have to kind of pick up the debts of everyone else to avoid the harm for everyone else. So I think there's a kind of question, actually when we're talking about the kind of regulatory response we should have, is actually trying to put a bit more risk back in the system, trying to bring a bit more consequence back in for investors uh, who shouldn't always just have to be incentivised into taking on investments um, by being protected from risk, but just incentivised. And does the reform that's needed kind of, you know, economically, is that going to require a lot more pain than perhaps we're just going to admit? And do we have the kind of political structures that can, you know, that can support that? Is there going to actually have, are things going to have to get a lot worse um, for them to get better in the long term. Okay, that's useful. L lady there, please. Um, so, just interestingly, following up with the gentleman in front of me's point, I did my A levels um, between 2008 and 2010, one of which was economics. So, my entire financial understanding was uh, predicated on the beginning of my financial education, beginning in 2008, um, which has definitely shaped how I see things. Um, and listening to a lot of talk about regulation and policy and, and your point, Maggie, about whether we're ever going to have regulation that's able to keep up with um, the sort of changing climates and particularly, I think, with the sort of, you know, financial technology and fintechs coming into the world, but also the onus that more and more people as individuals are taking in terms of their ethics and their standpoint on how they are consumers, not just of things like fair trade tea and coffee, but actually also what financial products that they're investing in and, and being involved in. Um, so I just wonder what your views are on the, not necessarily the onus to be on the individual, although I think a lot more people are taking responsibility, but on the onus of the industry to make things transparent enough that actually where people put their money, where people put their time, um, can help shift this balance of trust so that maybe financial services companies who are doing things that are revolutionary, that are more transparent, that are better for um, consumers but also society as a whole, um, can start to win that battle not just through regulatory reforms, but actually through the consumers being able to, to sort of put the money where their mouth is. Okay. Okay, I, I wanted to bring it back to the theme of the up? session, which was trust. Uh, yeah, to trust. Oh, sorry. Okay, thanks. Um, and <laughs> what I wanted to say was, if you like, we all know where the build-up of the, if you like, the, the pressures came from. It came from the US housing market. And if you like, the, the loss in trust was, you know, to paraphrase the Queen at the LSE, was because none of the authorities, economists, saw it coming. Why didn't you see it coming? It wasn't to do with the competency in the reaction to the crisis. In fact, the authorities, the Fed, uh, the G20, endured the huge expansion in China. The authorities actually reacted quite quickly to the crisis and in some ways ameliorated the crisis. It was the fact they didn't see it coming. And that was where the trust was lost. They lost the, the, the feeling that they were competent in managing the economy. So my big question is, if you are going to regain that trust again, then you have to show that you are competent. The authorities have to show they're competent. And they have to start seeing where the next crisis is going to come from. And here there are two big, big, if you like, areas that they need to start looking at, in my view. One is the sort of build up of debt in China, yes, and the huge pressures that are coming there. And two is the large deficits in the, in the pension funds that we have, again, which look really underfunded, and if they start collapsing, you are going to start to see a massive outcry and a reaction. Uh, okay. It's an interesting discussion to look at you know, where the pressure points could be, and, uh, and that has a role. But I'd like to raise uh, a different question, which is more on the sort of the intellectual changes that uh, are arrived today. Because there's a couple of descriptive phrases that have been used from the, from the panel. One is that there's been an erosion of trust in the system, and the other is that there's been a breakdown of consensus. And, you know, they sound a bit similar, but I think they're very, very different. And 
Uh, I think there has been definitely an erosion of trust in the capitalist model, uh, as uh, uh, Philippe has described and as others have described, but there hasn't really been a breakdown in consensus. Now here I, I agree with Philippe. You know, the same ideas which were there pre, as Daniel explained, pre-2008, are still the ideas there. It's not just the same people there. There's nobody challenging that. And that's really the big reason, or not, that's the big uh, expression, of the fact that this is one instance that history hasn't rhymed. History after the 1930s <coughs> is very, very different to history after the 2008. And why is that? And one can say it's, a, you know, it's an intellectual shortcoming of people today, but I don't think that takes us very far. It seems to me that if you look at, it wasn't the sort of the strength of the individuals of Roosevelt and Schumpeter and, and Keynes and, uh, and so on, Beveridge and those people. It was that they lived in a time in which even though there was a crisis of trust, a huge crisis of trust in capitalism, there was an openness to change. There is still an underlying belief that we could do things better. And I think it was that sense that there was a breakdown in the consensus then. There were people prepared to challenge things and say things could be different. And it seems to me that's, I would question, isn't that one of the big differences today? That we don't have that openness to change, so we just, as long as we can, patch and mend. It was there in the, in the 80s, it was there in the 90s, it was there in the 2000s, it's there today. And in that context, to finish, it seems to me that the, uh, the rise of what's called the rise of populism Whatever one thinks about the beneficiaries of who, who've been winning those elections, it does seem to me to be the rumblings of people anyway, not the elites, but the people saying things can be different. There is a possibility of a different way of doing things. And that openness to change among some people is, I think, the sort of thing we have to take advantage of and build upon with the good ideas of how things could be different. Okay, panel. Uh, if, if there's just like one point each that you want to come back on, don't try and tackle anything, like literally... For a minute maximum. Linda, anything you want to respond to? Yeah, I think I should probably respond to the last point. Um, so I spend a lot of my time um, traveling, and what is quite clear to me, and we did a Radio 4 program on this as well called State Capitalism, that around the world, the system in the West is essentially losing ground to what's viewed as a state capitalist or state-led Capitalists. And I'm not just describing China, I'm describing the new socialist economies most frequently associated uh, with some of the Nordic countries. There is almost, in terms of my travels, um, I would almost describe it as a, um, it's a very quiet breakdown, but it is a breakdown nevertheless, where I was recently in East Africa, I was in the Western Balkans, I was recently in the Middle East, and the system that these countries are looking to is really split between the American European model, which when I describe the end of communism, uh, the rejoining, the abandoning of communism came with democracy and capitalism and the rejoining of Eastern Central Europe to Western Europe was a goal. Um, but this system is losing out to this idea of more of a state capitalist system. And as I said, it's not only China, but obviously China is a big part of it. And some of the countries said to me, well, the system that you have, it's broken down. Even within your countries, people are looking to an alternative and it hasn't helped us. And look, maybe we ought to try something like what a state-led um, capitalist system would be. And by the way, if you go with the Beijing consensus, you also get money from the Belt and Road Initiative. Okay. So that might be part of the battle. But I certainly see that um, in terms of my travels. And that is something that I hadn't seen really to the same extent, um, except since the crisis. Okay. Philippe, anything you want to come back on? Well, I'll, I'll second Dave's plug for Adam Tooze's um, excellent book on, on the crisis. And... I mean, he, he points, talked about putting more risk into the system. And certainly one of the side effects of relying exclusively uh, on QE is that both investors and companies have skewed incentives. If you're an investor, you really have very little incentive to try and distinguish whether an investment is a good investment or a bad investment. It just depends whether...
uh, other investors feels like taking on risk or not. There's so much money sloshing around, at least until recently. That was true until the end of, of last year. Um, that didn't make much sense. And as a corporate, certainly in the US, it didn't make much sense to invest in the real economy when you could make great returns simply by buying back your shares. And so yeah, QE, which was meant to encourage broader economic growth, has been good at stabilizing the economy, but not at, at relaunching it. In terms of where the, you know, future crises could come from. I think it's not just, you know, Chinese debt, which I'm relatively sanguine about, or, or pensions deficits. There's also all the hidden leverage and complexity of ETFs, exchange traded funds, which are set out to be really nice, simple things and actually have become incredibly uh, complicated. Or it's the explosion of corporate debt predicated on the fact that interest rates were going to remain low forever uh, in the US or indeed in, in emerging economies. And, and now we're shifting to a world where interest rates are, are, are going up. And, and last, on, on Phil's point, yeah, I think it's true that there is a kind of narrowness of intellectual vision and um, a loss of um, faith in progress and therefore a belief that we can't do things differently. And I think there's also a lack of demand for change to a certain extent because the welfare state makes pain bearable in the way that pain bearable wasn't bearable in the 1930s and because there doesn't seem to be um, a set of alternative out ideas out there uh, around which people can rally. So I think it's a supply and a demand problem, and therefore there is a crying need um, for positive ideas for progress uh, to fill the vacuum that's being filled by uh, negative ideas for destructiveness like Trumpism. Okay, uh, Maggie, anything you want to pick up on? Yeah, briefly. To go to the first question, I think that the point of government uh, repeating the mistakes of the, the financial service sector, uh, and the examples of, of student loans, help to buy, et cetera. I, I think it is an interesting one to, to sort of broaden out. I mean, firstly, it raises huge issues of intergenerational fairness, which also were raised through the, the financial crisis. But I think it also looks at the short-term nature of decisions taken both within uh, politics, but also within business, and the need for a longer-term view in terms of value creation. We're already seeing an emergence of that with some companies who are, you know, through integrated reporting and different mechanisms, are actually looking to demonstrate how their impact on society as well as the investor is of critical importance, but also that long-term nature of their business model, which is supported by capital markets in terms of the approach. So I think there is an element of long-termism that we need to be bringing into to business as a whole. And then just to follow up very quickly on the, the second point about has the, has the understanding of ethics decreased, especially amongst um, younger, younger people come into the profession, be that, I think it was auditors and, and bankers. I'm going to look at it briefly from the auditor perspective. That's my background. I was an auditor. Um, I think actually it's the younger generation that get, should give us much more hope for the future uh, in terms of where they hold ethics and how important ethics are into their decision-making process, both in the where they want to be employed, but also in how they want to be employed. And I think there is a huge onus on the accountants and auditor profession to actually demonstrate the value before it is actually too late. Okay, thanks for finding Daniel. Uh, yeah, I'll just confine myself to a couple of uh, quick points. The Adam Tews book uh, people have referred to, Crashed, which is widely seen as the definitive book on the financial crisis, is extremely annoying. I, it's over, I've read it from cover to cover, it's over 700 pages, a huge number of references, and it ends with questions, which is a bit annoying because you would hope that he would at least have tentative answers, but there are no answers, uh, not even kind of tentative ones. It's, uh, it's loads and loads of facts, an impressive collection of facts, but I, I do, if you're interested in the subject, I do urge you to read, read my review on Spike, you can Google it and find it. But, but one thing that he says it, that was right was that many people before 2008 did think there would be a financial crisis, but the consensus would be that it's in relation to China rather than the whole subprime thing. So I think we need to be very careful about anticipating where the next financial crisis will come from. I'm confident in saying there will be another big financial crisis, but when, where, I don't know. People can bluff, but they might guess right, but very, very hard to, to uh, say for sure. The other thing I wanted to say in relation to ethics People forget, I mean, there were ethics codes long before the Lehman crisis. I don't know about the ACCA, but there's the CFA 
uh, Chartered Financial Analyst qualification, which is a kind of global gold standard if you're working in the investment markets, which has had an ethics paper, which I think a friend of mine was doing it before the financial crisis, I think was 20% of your marks, long before Lehman. So having an ethics code, I'm not saying people should be dishonest or anything, but I think there are limits to uh, what ethics codes can do, particularly going back to the main thrust of my introduction, when you have these objective economic problems that have been there since the 70s and 80s and which are kind of pushing the economy and the financial markets in all sorts of problematic directions, as long as those problems aren't addressed, then we're going to have more financial crisis and crises and more economic misery. So we shouldn't forget the core economic problems that we need to contend with. Okay. Having lived through two recessions, um, it's, I think it might be interesting also to compare the, 19, uh, the early 80s recession to this one because uh, it's interesting how different it felt um, at the time where you had three million people unemployed. Um, uh, you couldn't get any credit at all if you were unemployed. Um, it, it was, uh, you know, it, London felt hollowed out. I was in Liverpool at the time. It was just a sort of hollowed out shell, really, of a city. And then you compare it to the feeling now. I was just in Liverpool recently, you know, sort of very thriving city centre. So the way that, that the responses to the two recessions have been completely different uh, in, in style. Um, and lots of the speakers have talked about QE and... Um, I, I, I've got a couple of questions, really, which is that um, uh, the, the public sector cuts, were they as, you know, I, I don't know enough about the, the finances, but were they as deep this time round as last time round? Because although we, we know that things like incapacity benefit was cut and stuff like that, it does feel as if this, with this welfareism um, has sort of created a very muted response. Um, not simply, uh, it's, it's also obviously the, the lack of alternative ideas that people have mentioned, but they seem to be the sort of amelioration of the worst aspects of the recession do seem to have been controlled through, the ch through cheap credit. Um, and it sort of feels like we're in this sort of um, purgatory, really, never-ending purgatory, uh, where, the, where, uh, where we just don't seem to be able to move forward. Okay, it's going to bring Dan to the front. Um, uh, so that, and, then, and then I'll take you. And I think that'll have to be it because we're running out of time. Sorry. Thank, thank you. Um, there does appears to me to be a, a contradiction or clash between the ethical, the ethics that you were talking about, and raising productivity, um, which I can't really work out uh, because raising productivity means producing more, obviously in a shorter space of time, for more people. And that seems to clash because the, ethic, the ethics and the moral, morals since the last 10 years seem to have grown bigger. They embrace the planet. Now we've got to be very careful about the planet. It's gone out of Occupy Wall Street, the bankers, now it's more. So the ethics has become much broader in its meaning, I think. And so when you're actually consuming more, you're producing more, you are harming the planet more. Do you understand what I'm saying? And um, that's why I see the clash. And I think that those ideas, I think if we are going to move forward, it's, it's dealing with ideas and ideology. Because the way I see it as well is that I think the people who have been managing capitalism after the, clash, uh, the crash have actually been quite pleased that the, of the development in the ethics. Because they have been let off the hook, so to speak, of dealing with the problems of the economy on a bigger level, on a deeper level, and raising product, and dealing with the product, production of productivity, increasing productivity. Yeah, just one lesson I hope we've all learned is that austerity does not seem to work. The USA didn't embark on austerity, large austerity measures, and they've recovered far faster than we have in this country. And uh, we seem as if we've been duped into this idea that the nurses and the teachers and the firefighters should pay for the mistakes of the bankers, or let's put this in a more financial way, that the education industry, the security industry, the uh, uh, um, education industry should pay for uh, or, or should boost, uh, by depressing those industries, should boost the economy for our 
country and that in some way uh, that we've been duped into the idea that um, our household, managing our household income is in some way related to how we manage uh, the economics of the nation state and that's a populist view and that shouldn't have happened and that's what we should have learned. Okay, thank you very much. Point each, just to sum up, or a takeaway message that you might want to, to, to give people. Linda, do you want to, to sure. start that process? Um, I think my, my takeaway is um, I think all of, the, uh, all of the questions and interventions have been so interesting. I think you've raised a number of different aspects, um, ranging from ethics to thinking about then and now to talking about the impact of austerity, the contrast of productivity. To me, this is exactly the kind of conversations we should all be having in order to find those new ideas that build a new consensus to shape the way that we want to live. So my takeaway is thank you. Thank you so much for, uh, for coming to share your thoughts. And I, uh, I took away a lot from what you've all said. So maybe my next book will be The New Consensus, but I won't be able to write it for like 50 years. So. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Philippe. Well, the, the lady uh, ju there just uh, uh, contrasted her experience in the recession of the 80s with the recent recession. And of course, they were very different. Um, the, both the early 80s and the early 90s recession um, were about squeezing inflation out of the system by the central bank raising interest rates in order to lower demand uh, and bring inflation down. And obviously the recent uh, long double dip uh, recession was about combating deflation uh, and therefore involved huge um, uh, monetary expansion. And the way in which it was reflected was also very different. In the early 80s and the early 90s, the losses were concentrated on a few people. Unemployment soared, as you said, to, to three million, and those people really suffered. The vast majority of people who stayed in their jobs didn't suffer that much. And actually, in a sense, what we're experiencing, the, 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 the big fall in wages that almost everyone has suffered, in a sense, has also is, is in a sense been fairer because the pain has been spread more widely. Though I agree that it has been um, shocking in the way that bankers and others who profited uh, from the financial boom have shifted the losses of the crisis uh, on to others. Last but not least, I agree that, um, that uh, austerity doesn't work. We should have learnt that from the 1930s. Um, you know, there was a brief moment of fiscal expansion um, collectively after 2008, uh, and then that was reversed from 2010 onwards, and that was a catastrophic mistake. Final, final point, um, you know, we need to have a much bigger debate than this. Uh, we need to have a debate about what kind of economy uh, and what kind of uh, society we want to live in. Uh, we need to draw some lessons from the financial crisis, but above all, look to the future uh, with new ideas uh, to make things better and not simply dwell on the minutiae of what has happened, um, but move forward uh, with optimism uh, towards progress. Okay, uh, Maggie. Very uh, briefly follow on the final points, and I think it's been uh, great to hear the, the amount of focus on ethics, which I think is, as, is at the, the very core. Uh, I think it's interesting in the final few points about the fact that the losses of the crisis weren't borne by the bankers, but were borne by the, the broader public uh, and the public sector workers, and I think that is, is very much true, and I think it's a slightly hidden uh, element, and it isn't just the, the nurses and the, and the firefighters. I would agree that austerity doesn't work, and I think it's going to be one of the longer-term ramifications that we see coming out of the financial crisis in terms of living standards, in terms of longevity, and we're already seeing the first reversals in terms of life expectancy. So I think 10 years on from the financial crisis and we're all going to live a year less. So um, I think in terms of it, the debate here is clearly broadened out to much more broader issues of, along society, along the environment side, and I think it, it gives me great hope in terms of the, the potential for future discussions. Thank you, Maggie. Finally, Daniel. Yeah, I mean, in a way, the fundamental problem is ethics, but not quite in the way that Maggie and many other people use it, because I think we have what you might call an ethic of low expectations. In other words, what is considered to be responsible, what is considered to be ethical, is that we rein in our desires, we don't try to move forward, we don't try to make a productive society. I, I think that, that is a key problem. And austerity, people, I think, I don't agree with some of the things you said, people misunderstand austerity, because... They react against the fact that governments are cutting public spending, and yeah, to a degree that's understandable. But very often they accept the fact that there's a kind of self-imposed austerity 
that people often go along with, certainly the politicians are pushing. So the idea is, for the sake of the planet, we've got to rein in our desires and not be ambitious because of it doesn't make us happy, we shouldn't have more material possessions because of inequality, we need to make do with less. So there's a very much a kind of, not austerity in the narrow sense, but a kind of impetus on us to all make do with less. And I would say to tackle the fundamental economic problems that we face, we need to have a, an intellectual revolution, we need to have higher expectations, not this ethic of low expectations, but an ethic of high expectations, uh, which means we have the confidence and intellectual ammunition to really tackle the deep-seated economic problems that do face us. Okay, thank, can we thank our panel? Uh, so as I said earlier... Thank you.